Uh, first thing I want to start with, um, so where are you currently living and what's your day-to-day and then what's your training background? Yeah, sure. Brilliant. Um, so three questions. Uh, the first one is incredibly easy to answer. Um, I, I live with my wife, uh, three dogs and two cats um, in a beautiful part of the world called Jervis Bay, which is about two and a half hours south of Sydney. So a little piece of paradise. We actually live in Huskisson, which is uh, known as the gateway to Jervis Bay. So uh, I feel very, very fortunate to live here. I uh, have lived here for on and off many years um, and always told myself that to never take it for granted. And we don't, for sure not. Um, Certainly what's day-to-day look like. It varies, of course, um, at what phases we're at with the different projects we're working on. Um, in this case, the events that we're working on. Uh, but the day-to-day, actually, I, I like to train in the morning. That's my background, actually, to training twice a day. Um, so I'm very much the early riser, um, which can also be read as I'm a very poor sleeper. Uh, so I'm an, I'm an early bird, and I, I love nothing more than the first thing I do when I get out of bed um, is train. I like to train. I, I don't have breakfast first. Um, I just I feed the tribe um, and then, yeah, train in some form. And typically uh, that would be these days, it's very much uh, sort of strength, strength and wad based type training in the morning. Um, but then, yeah, for me, it's very much off, off to the office, really. And um, if I'm not going to see a client, because uh, I've got a couple of different uh, business avenues, but if I'm not seeing a client, which I'm often not these days, I, I'm almost full time, really, on the Bay Games and everything that is the Bay Games. Um, then, I, then I'm at the office here and literally I'm, I'm in the office now. And as I, I can't show you, unfortunately, because it's the camera's built into the screen, but uh, certainly I'm looking across Jervis Bay. So um, I'm in the main high street of, of Huskisson. And again, I don't take that for granted either. So uh, that's certainly day to day. I mean, certainly, um, yeah, I tend to train in the afternoon as well, sort of at the end of the day. But that's, that's more often a conditioning set that might be, um, you know, ski erg bike related uh, rower or in fact i have to say or just going for a run because uh, again we w- where we live we're sort of straight onto the footpath straight into the national park uh, and just some spectacular running trails available and um certainly to answer your third question um in terms of training background um it, it's very much has historically been very much around endurance training so um triathlon iron distance is where i started literally um i did a, a little baby triathlon here in um in Jervis Bay, actually, was the first one I did, uh, even before I lived here, and uh, just loved it, uh, absolutely loved it, and decided, well, okay, I, th- at that stage, I was um, going through a divorce, sadly, um, and, yeah, I decided that I had two choices. I could either go down the path of drinking beers and partying, or knowing my personality, probably better not to, and decided, therefore, to sign up for an Ironman event um, over in Western Australia, and went, for, yeah, basically gave myself eight months lead in from, didn't even own a bike at that point. And uh, not naturally a great swimmer. <laughs> being, being a POM doesn't come naturally. <laughs> and um, yeah, decided to go and do a full distance iron, an Ironman. And um, yeah, very quickly realized having signed up for that. And I'm a great believer in that, sign up for it. Um, and then kind of you've committed to it. For me, that works mentally. That gives me something um, that, that motivates me. And uh, yeah, got myself a coach pretty quickly. And um, yeah, actually really devoted a lot of my life to building up for that first distance I'm and I, and I loved it, to be honest. So I then, um, out of a base of Singapore, my wife and I, my, my now wife, Nerida and I, um, lived in Singapore and were into the ultra distance scene. And some of the races we did um, were the race across America, which is 5,000 clicks. Um, from the west to the east coast of America, non-stop as a team of four. We did that a couple of times. He says so flippantly, oh, I just did that a couple of times. That's a really big effort. <laughs> uh, how, <laughs> long, all... how long does that take? The four? Well, uh, that took us about six days, 11 hours and some minutes. Yeah, wow. um, But we did it as a team of four. They have two teams of two. And so two are in the support vehicle, sleeping and eating and going ahead as this pair kind of take it in turns 20 minutes at a time on the bike. We did four hour blocks. You do four hours of 20 minutes taking it in turns and then you get in the car um, and try and sleep and eat and whatever you can in four hours as, as that car races ahead. So, I mean, for a team of four, we had 13, I think 13 or 14 support crew, three vehicles. So it's kind of a big deal. Um, absolutely amazing experiences. So uh, those were a couple of events we did. Uh, I certainly competed in, uh, I did certainly some ultra distance running, uh, but as well, I did uh, an event called um, 
used to be called Ultraman Canada. Um, it's now Ultra 520 Canada, I think. Um, but, but an amazing event, which was a three day event solo um, with lots of swimming, lots of riding, lots of running. Um, so that, those kind of events, that, that, that's very much my training background. So when I discovered the sort of functional fitness style of training and then fell into the world of, um, of CrossFit, uh, totally different, the polar opposite of what I was used to. And still even now, I'm, I consider myself very much transitioning, um, but loving it. And I think there are aspects of it, such as the technical aspects, the, there's so much to learn, there's so much to, to continue trying to, I use the word perfect, um, I don't know that I've perfected too much of it, um, but you're also, I, I, you know, I constantly strive for that, and I find that very motivating, plus the community. Um, that was definitely, even though I used to enjoy the, the long solo stuff, uh, I, I very much enjoy the, the community that I'm now a part of as a result of functional fitness. Um, I, I appreciate the bond that that creates. You know, you kind of sweat together, you, you hurt together, you laugh together and kind of take the piss together as well. It, it's, uh, it's nice to have that uh, community spirit and uh, certainly ha having, you know, with now the Bay Games um, on my desk, uh, which is a massive part of our lives. Uh, and I appreciate that. Um, to be exposed to so many of those communities around Australia and then in fact the world is just an awesome, awesome uh, thing. Yeah, wow. Well. Um, yeah, no doubt. Um, Jervis Bay is a beautiful place. I've, I've had the pleasure to, to head down there. It's about, I'm in Newcastle in New South Wales. So it's about, I think, six hours roughly. Um, so I don't get to go down there too often, but um, I always try and, you know, um, make the effort to go, uh, you know, all around Australia, there's, there's such nice places. And you would have seen some amazing places doing your ultra running as well, which is one of the benefits of doing it. Like not only you're, you're pushing yourself and when you, when you finish it, you've, you've got that sense of achievement and just, just training for something like that. You in the run and in the moment over those like four, three or four or six, six day events or whatever, the scenery and the, the places that you get to experience are just unreal, which is one of the things I love about, um, trail running. I haven't done any really long runs, uh, but it's definitely on my goals to to do a long run of some sort. Now, what is it? What is it you think that kind of drew you? But for, firstly, props for going for straight from a sprint triathlon to an Ironman. Um, uh, what is it about um, those long distance endurance events that you think draw drew you to them? Um, well, I think there's a couple of things. At, at that moment, uh, it was very much, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it was at, the st at that stage going through, it was separated and was going through um, a divorce. And I know me, um, I have quite a, um, yeah, my, my personality is such that uh, I have an addictive personality and I didn't want to fall into the trap of starting to get, you know, get into the party scene, drinking loads of beers, and that's kind of all you do. Um, I didn't want to do that. I, I know me well enough. And that's not the lifestyle I wanted. It's, at the end of the day, I was aware of that. So for me, it was very much a filler at that point in my life. It was something to really focus on, um, something that, uh, <laughs> that, that actually, yeah, I guess there was a fear element, no question about it, um, that drove me to become very, very obsessive about it. You know, the, the training twice a day and, learning new skills trying to learn how to swim better and more efficiently um also swimming is a very technical pastime if you want to be competitive at that um, so that that was the initial motivation but i've got to be honest i i love the mental aspect of it i love that pushing pushing my limits to try and find where the limits are um it's all that sounds a bit cliche but it's true um I, for me it was a whole new world and Historically, you know, way back when I played rugby at school, sure, I did. I was always kind of running, but not really competing so much. Um, it was just more to maintain maybe weight um, and without realizing it in ignorance at the time, you know, the whole endorphins thing and so on. So certainly the uh, getting into the long distance stuff, I very much appreciated the routine of it. Again, speaking you know, to the addictive personality, that that desire for routine I, I i still appreciate routine very much I, I personally think it's important for all of us um but but the mindset um if i think about the solitude of 
you know, long rides. Well, I guess long swims, but I, I had to think about my swimming quite often. Whereas if I was riding, yeah, sure. Um, obviously, I'm taking care on traffic and so on. But I, I, w- I, had, I was fortunate enough to, to be riding in sort of low traffic areas. So I, that was a lot of thinking time for me. My mind could just, it was almost meditative and certainly the long runs, um, very much so. And initially, I would listen to podcasts or audiobooks because I felt, <laughs> um, here's some insight, I felt like I was, oh, I'm being so greedy with my time. You know, I'm, I'm taking hours and hours and hours each week with my training and it felt like I selfish almost um, and to justify that I'd listen to business podcasts and I you know self-improvement and all those good stuff and, and there's value in that no question I, I still enjoy that but actually I, I came to a point where I I stopped listening to anything when I was going for the long runs and so on but certainly I never listened to anything on the bike I was always no no earphones uh, but on the runs I, I, I grew to appreciate the solitude of that and really found it meditative and I you know I was doing training runs at my peak there there was one training run that was well, I think it was 38 or 42 kilometers that was a training run uh, it's all relative um I don't know if I'd want to do that tomorrow but uh I, I remember it just the time just went um because I knew where I was it was in a beautiful environment it was safe so you know my mind was able to to kind of just and it was yeah before I knew it I was kind of nearing the end of that run and I'd gone through the routine. It was very much the routine of hydration, nutrition and all of those good things. It was a well-oiled machine at that point. Um, and yeah, I think that was really what really drew me in. And sometimes I miss that uh, whilst I appreciate the, the training I'm now doing. And I think that's more future proof, to be honest. I think it's um, I think it's more relevant. You know, I'm, I'm just just beyond mid 40s, um, and, which is not old and that's fine. Uh, and I could continue doing the ultra distance stuff. but I think. The functional fitness, it feels, A, I enjoy it, and B, it feels more future-proof. Um, you know, I want to hit the half century and bounce on just doing what I'm doing, but better, stronger, fitter. Um, and it, it bugs me when I hear people say, ah, oh, well, you know, I'm 50 now. That, that really grinds on me because it's meaningless as a number, meaningless. And so I'm determined to lead by example in that way. And, in fact, we were chatting recently at, uh, at the box across the Jervis Bay where I train. Uh, with Ned and um, one of them commented they'd never heard me use my age as an excuse you know when I can't lift as heavy a weight or my mobility's crap or you know I'm not great on the rig or whatever it is Um, and I never ever use my age and I won't I refuse to that's a conscious decision I've made that because I think that's that's not a valid excuse (laughs) I've got others Um, mine is normally I can't do that very well because I've run out of talent. That's the issue right now. I just have run out of talent <laughs> and be honest about it. But, um, but certainly, yeah, to answer your question, I think it was the uh, appreciating the solitude, the mental fortitude and the, the grit and determination um, when, when it gets tough, how to deal with that mentally. Because um, you're talking to yourself, you're in your own head. There's no one else there. There's not a team to talk to other than events like the Ram. And, and for sure, the one in Canada, I had a support crew, um, but they're not with you in your head, running alongside you or riding alongside you. And let me tell you, day one of that event in Canada, I, I did a number on myself in that swim. I, I just went too hard. Um, I had the red mist race day, off we go. And, you know, that was a three hour, 10 minute swim for me. It was a 10K swim, uh, fresh water in a lake. Uh, that doesn't come naturally. I trained for it, obviously, but I did go out a little bit spicy, um, which is a little bit my technique. My, my approach to a competition or a race is to set and forget. Um, I like to be chased. I don't like to chase people. I want to be hunted. Um, I find that more motivating. And so that, that's what happened. Yeah, I'm, and that's okay. I hung on to it, um, but, but I paid for it on the bike when I got out of the water. And um, that, that certainly is one of my more memorable occasions of drawing on the reserves of all of that training I'd done and all of those wanting to stop, wanting to sit, wanting to, you know, your mind finding excuses as to why, why you should walk, why you should stop, why you should get a drink over there, why you should check your shoelace, why you should anything, anything. The mind will, I mean, it, it's self-preservation. It's natural. It's, it's the way the brain works. It wants to stop you hurting yourself. It wants to stop the pain. Um, it's about self-preservation. So overcoming that, um, I think, A, it's a very valuable skill 
who have had the opportunity to learn. Um, and somehow I miss that a little bit, if I'm honest. I mean, yes, sure, I hurt in the workouts now in the functional fitness world. But it's a different kind of hurt. Um, not better or worse, uh, not harder or less, it's just different. Uh, and I quite liked, I used to quite like the idea of being 20 Ks from home. There's only one way to get back. And if I run, it's quicker. If I walk, it's going to take me forever. You know, those are the kind of things you'd say to yourself and you just keep going. So, yeah, I think, um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, no, there definitely is um, some great benefits from doing those long, long runs, um, some meditative benefits, which, um, you know, overcoming your, your own thoughts, if you're, only, if you're running for hours and like you said, you're only fight, the person you're fighting is inside your head. So if you have any doubts of like, oh, maybe, you know, oh, I'm, I'm under pace or I'm going too slow or I'm going too quick, you've, you've just, it's just your thoughts that you've got to overcome. And that, that could be for hours. You're alone with your thoughts. And that is basically a form of meditation. Uh, people don't look at it like that, but it is. If you don't have music or earphones in or whatever, um, you're just alone with your thoughts. Um, and doing that over and over again, you get better at, you know, the self-talk and just overcoming, listening to your thoughts. And it's, it's really powerful. And like you said, that's, that's some good stuff that you can learn and then take to other aspects of your life once you move on or and do other things or whatever but once you learn those things you um you don't forget them you learn that and that mindset that you build like that mental toughness to just keep pushing or like and don't stop because you have a choice to listen to if you want to stop and you're thinking oh should i just stop you have a choice to stop or you have a choice to keep going and if you choose to you know keep going building that mental toughness is so um rewarding and you can take that and apply it to other areas of your life, which is great. Um, Absolutely. One of the other um, benefits I still have from that um, is learning how to pace. Uh, it makes me smile, you know, at our box. And I, you know, I train there as many days a week as they're open. And I always smile, you know, three, two, one, go. And, you know, some of the, uh, it's not just the young guns, you know, some of the, but I guess, you know, everyday athletes who haven't had the experience of learning over many, many hours, days, weeks, months about pacing, about listening to their body. And I, and I certainly towards, yeah, for the last two or three years, um, the, the only gizmo I would have would be um, a Garmin with distance on it, distance and time. That's all I cared about. I wasn't even focused on pace because I knew the pace. I knew what I was running at. Um, without looking um, my running buddies now still laugh because I, I often wear no no electronics at all um, and and I'll ask them what pace do you want to sit on and they oh, you know, sit on this pace and they laugh because they've got the gizmos and go <laughs> that, that's really accurate you're running at that pace it's well yeah absolutely you do it enough you do anything enough and you you just know um, but certainly Dan you know we're doing a three two one go type workout um, yep and it's the hare and the tortoise often the case um, it's not to say I win every time, far from it, but the people that go out first and on the whole just, you know, are smashing themselves for, if it's a, a longer AMRAP. And I, yep, yeah, that's okay. You've got to know where you're at. And um, I guess I love the phrase, and it's not mine, but I'm going to use it. it it's, not about, it's not about who goes the fastest. It's about who slows down the least. Um, and nothing, nothing is more true than that. Um, and it was the same in the ultra endurance scene. Uh, that's my background, and it's the same now. I mean, if you're doing an AMRAP, um, it, it's who slows down the least. So it's all about pacing. That's a really valuable, you know, one of the valuable skills that I, I imagine will stay with me indefinitely now, and I appreciate that. But it certainly took a lot of time to hone that, um, to absorb that and, and sort of commit it to muscle memory almost. Yeah, I really like that quote. I really like that a lot. I think it was um, Rich Roll's uh, coach. So I've got to give kudos to him. That's yeah, where okay. I got that from. Chris, uh, I forget his name now, Chris someone. Um, but Rich Roll, actually, Rich Roll T-shirt. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, uh, he, uh, yeah, but it's brilliant. What, what, a great, what a great quote, and it's true. And I, I think more people in the functional fitness space could uh, do well to, to think about that. <laughs> All right, I want to um, ask another question. So I, wanna, I want you to tell me about the moment when 
you finally decided to commit to running uh, a functional fitness competition um, that is the Bay Games and why you wanted to create this. Is that what it was always called or was it something else? Is this the first um, fitness competition you've run or tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. It's the first sport event um, that I've ever sort of founded and run. Absolutely. Um, actually, the way it came about was um, our origin story, if you like, was where are we now? So probably about three and a half years ago, um, my wife and I were with a couple of mates. We went to watch the uh, Dan and the CrossFit Championships that were then still called regionals. And uh, we were sat in the audience in Wollongong, um, which depending on where you are in the world, that's just south of Sydney, about let's say an hour south of Sydney by car. Um, great event. And we were watching, um, actually the year we were there, we had uh, yeah, you had the tiers of this world. They were all there competing. Um, obviously, different different scene now, but uh, you know, James Newbury was there. So there's some, some really big hitters there. And we were watching in awe of these athletes you know, p- competing, do, doing what they were doing. It was an amazing atmosphere. And we kind of looked around and, you know, we were caught up in the moment and it was amazing. And it was actually my wife, Nerido and Ned, who said, you know, this is awesome. You know, we, we, could, we could do something like this, um, but it's not, not for the pros. You know, what, what about us? Where, where do we go to, to get this experience? Um, and, and she said, yeah, we, we could do this in Jervis Bay. And um, we could call it the Bay Games. And I swear to God, that's exactly how it happened. And uh, we all looked at each other and kind of went, yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, and so literally, I think five months later, the, the Bay Games, the inaugural Bay Games, which was a one-day event uh, back then, uh, kicked off. And we learned a lot of lessons. Um, there were another couple involved at that stage, Dale and Shelby, um, and the four of us put it all together. And yeah, sure, we, we kind of figured it out and learned a lot of lessons. And at the end of the day, it was a, a great event. It was a load of fun. And there was such a buzz around it that we realized, hmm, okay, there's something to this. People, you know, this is something that's not just us that appreciate to have something like this available for the everyday athletes, but actually there's loads of everyday athletes that, that kind of want it. Um, and so we decided to double down and turn it into really an event. Uh, and so, yeah, the following year and onwards was a, a two day event. Um, and it's grown from there. And I think the numbers are, we went from, I think we had 130 athletes in year one, uh, which it was a pretty short lead time, I have to say. So even that was pretty impressive. <laughs> um, but then year two, we, we blew it up to something like 600 athletes. And last year we had just over a thousand athletes, so it's just exploded really. And uh, that doesn't happen by accident. Um, you know, we've put a lot of work into it. We still do. Um, Dale and Shelby have stepped out to focus on the, their gym business. Um, you know, as the day games has got bigger, so did their business. And you know, at the end of the day, um, there's only, in their case, two pairs of hands. Um, so uh, it's myself and, and Nerida and, and, and the team around us, of course. Um, I put a lot of time and energy into it and love it. Love it. It's one of those, you know, they talk about, you know, you to find something you're passionate about and work on it. It shouldn't feel like work. I can tell you now the Bay Games does not feel like work. It is a lot of work, but I don't get out of bed and go, oh, this is what I'm going to do today. Far from it. It's awesome. Absolutely awesome. Uh, and, and loving it, to be honest. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a tr- troubling time now for everyone. When we're recording this, of course, we've got the coronavirus pandemic we're, we in Australia are about two, two, three weeks into it um, at the time of recording. And um, like everyone, you know, it raises questions around feasibility, how to handle it, what to do. Um, but the journey of the Bay Games so far has been amazing. And, and honestly, some of, the, some of the friendships that have formed out of the base of that, the community um, that it has created and helped foster, it's priceless. It's, it's awesome. Um, wouldn't change it for the world. Yeah, great stuff. It is a really good event. I've had the pleasure to uh, go down there for the last two years to um, to see it and take part. Um, it's really good. What I really liked about it was it's one of the first, um, you know, local competitions that I've seen that kind of offered, you know, an aspect outside of the gym but still incorporating your functional fitness with swimming and stand up paddleboard 
and, you know, more like, and, and what better place to do that? Jervis Bay. Hmm. It's a gorgeous place. So um, it's, it was a really, really great experience to go down there. And, um, and like you said, it's, it's just growing each year, which is really good to see. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the Bay Games shortly. There's a couple other things I want to ask you first um, before sure. we before we dive into more about the Bay Games. But um, sure. I want to know how you manage to personally maintain like a work life balance. That, that's a great question um, because you know I, I'm I, re- I refer to myself as a reforming corporate prostitute. Um, so, <laughs> um, and that's the normal response, which so I appreciate it. Um, and I say that because I, you know, for 20 years I was in a corporate environment uh, along the way, I'd had some small businesses. You know, I used to own a dive shop here in Jervis Bay actually 20 years ago. Um, little known fact, in fact, little known fact by most people in the functional fitness sphere is, um, I used to be a police officer in the UK. That's how I, I left school and became a police officer in Birmingham. So if anyone's watched Peaky Blinders, um, my name is Thomas Shelby. Um, if anyone's watched that, for me, it was weird because that's where I'm from. And so that accent, the Birmingham accent, which personally I think is eh, uh, not ideal. Um, but when they were talking about it, you know, they talk about Digbeth Steelhouse Lane, is the names they use, are, that's where I grew up, actually. So um, anyway, I, I get off topic. But um, the uh, yeah, I certainly, I guess, corporate corporate prostitute um, based in Singapore, working for a German company, um, you know, t- team, business development team around the world, all of that direct reports in three, four different continents. And obviously that, that's very, a very rigid structure. That's very, you know, you're very accountable, um, in that environment, both to those above and those reporting to you. Um, so when I left that four years ago now, I chose to step out. I'd had enough. Um, it had no soul for me. Great company. I have to say great company. I worked for, um, really nice team. Um, great package. Everything was right about it. I just wasn't into it. Um, it had no soul for me. So I stepped out. And for, so for the last four years, I, I've been the author of my own destiny. I manage my time. Literally, it's up to me what I do every minute of every day. And finding that work-life balance was something I really found hard to start with because I didn't have that routine, that structure that the corporate job gave me. Um, and I, again, I used to feel guilty. If I went for a long run, I'd feel guilty because, oh, you know, I should be working on business. I should be doing this. I should be doing that. And I feel guilty about the training. Um, these days I've let go of that and understand how important. Um, and maybe it's now because I'm part of a community, you know, in the functional fitness sphere. Maybe that's the difference. I haven't really thought about it until now. Great question. Um, I, it's a priority for me. I have prioritized my training um, and, and I acknowledge it's not selfish. It, it's part of my, if you like, self-help, if you like, self-management process um, because it makes me feel good. It's healthy physiologically, but it's great mentally as well um, to be part of that community. To, For me, I, I like training first thing in the morning, tick the box. I feel good about myself because I know I've trained. And even if I have to miss the second session at the end of the day, that's okay. I can let go of that. But if I hadn't trained in the morning and then I didn't train in the evening, oh, that doesn't sit right with me. I'd get itchy because um, I love training. You know, and again, it's that endorphin rush. It's the, it's the camaraderie. It's the connection to all of those things. Um, you know, having that bit of fatigue, carrying that bit of fatigue around all day, I actually appreciate that um, and enjoy it. So I had to learn how to give myself permission to prioritize working out um, and ever since I did that um, it's amazing how it's just more enjoyable because there's no guilt attached to it um, and I certainly you know more and more um, I, I think you know the whole mental health topic and you know I'm not aware that I've ever struggled with mental health topics not that I know of um, but that's what they say right that's that's the thing about mad people they don't know they're mad um, <laughs> Ricky Gervais um, it's true though isn't it <laughs> on the whole. Um, but I, I know people who do struggle with mental health or have struggled with, men, with mental health. Um, and I'm much more alert to that now. And so, you know, I understand how the community and the training can help them. Uh, and particularly now with the whole C19 topic going on, really taking care that no one gets left behind. 
you know, who's gone quiet on the Facebook group? Who's not turning up on the Zoom session? Um, like be really aware of that and kind of reach out to them and go, hey, how are you going? Um, just, just checking in. Um, and of course, you know, the, the great, you know, we're aligned with, are you okay here in Australia? It's the perfect question. Are you okay? Um, so certainly, um, yeah, th- th- I think that, yeah. Did I answer your question? I yeah, hope so. yeah, no, you did. Um, <laughs> I want to go back to the Bay Games. Um, now, I know the Bay Games is evolving, so why don't you dive into a few things that you've got coming up or some future plans? What's, what's the future of the Bay Games look like for you for now? Yeah, sure. I appreciate that question. Um, actually, it's interesting. When you said earlier uh, that um, it's getting bigger and bigger, it, it is, um, which is awesome. But actually, we, that's not the intention um, per se. It's not that we want to go from 1,000 to 2,000 athletes because there's a risk that it would lose some of the magic that we perceive, certainly that, that, that sort of that real sense of community and connection, all of those things. If you get too big, um, then it might lose that. Um, just, I, I know recording is fine. This is real life, isn't it? Is that too sunny now? Right. No, I think that's all right. Okay, but I'll do that. Um, we're, it's an, we're everyday athletes. It's all good. The audience forgive us. Um, it's just what it is, isn't it? Yeah. I don't have people around in the background <laughs> but uh, so our intention actually is with the bay games jervis bay the home of the bay games is to i don't think we'll get much more beyond about 1200 athletes we think that's around the number we can max out at and still deliver an awesome event but that's the point at that point we simply want to make it more and more awesome um we want to because what we're trying to do is re- provide everyday athletes with an elite ex- elite type experience so what the elite athletes get as an experience, we're trying to reproduce that, which is one of the reasons we introduced live streaming last year, um, amongst other things. And so the aspiration is to make it just awesome rather than just making it bigger. Um, however, um, best will in the world, uh, the amount of work that goes into it, you know, speaking candidly, to have just that event Taking, considering how much time goes into it, it's not sustainable, not really. Um, and therefore, there's, there's two, ang- two avenues that we're pursuing. Um, there, there is likely to be a Bay Games um, internationally next year. We've been approached by an event management company about running a Bay Games somewhere else in the world. I'm being a bit coy. I'm not saying where. <laughs> no, you, um, don't to, you don't have to give away anything that you don't want to just yet. Well, the risk is it doesn't happen and then, you know, it's... It's for nothing, but there's you know, a very clear discussion being opened and, and even down to having conversations with uh, the authorities where they're thinking of running it and so on. So it's, it's started, um, which is pretty exciting. Uh, and w- the idea is not just to license it off. I, I, don't, think you can, I don't think that would work uh, because, again, you've got to maintain the spirit of the event. And if you just license it off for money, that, that's... So we'd be heavily involved in um, delivery of any of those events, uh, but obviously having local feet on the ground to handle logistics and, and legalities, of course, is very helpful. Um, but the other way, I guess the most impactful way that we can try and bring the Bay Games to the rest of the world, uh, the everyday athletes around the world, is via our online competition called the Grand Slam. Now, we ran the Grand Slam last year um, before online comps were getting as trendy as they are now. Um, back then, it was a, an individual uh, event, as in it was for individuals, very much following uh, the Cross the Open model i guess um and look the, the event went really well and we, we had the you know massive live announcements that were live streamed with a media crew and we, we we really went for it um and first year i mean we didn't have we weren't overwhelmed with registrations let me say it that way um but we had enough it was a very it was a cool competition everyone enjoyed it um and in fact we had part of what people could win was flights to Australia. So we did, we had a, a lady called Leanne Watson, for example, she was uh, the female um, advanced or RX international winner. So we flew her from Morgantown in North America. We flew her to Sydney. We picked her up and brought her down to Jervis Bay and we accommodated her and she competed in the main arena of the Bay Games. Super cool. Name another comp that's doing that. Um, and she, she was just a joy. And yeah, she uh, happens to be an amazing lady as well, um, who's now very much a, a friend of ours and who's hoping to come back this year under the same terms. <laughs> um, but, um, so, the, yeah, the Grand Slam, the one thing that didn't really resonate with us 
I, I guess we we dug in after that. We did a full debrief and uh, we, we actually polled our audience on the back of our, our own ideas about running it as a pairs event for teams of two rather than individuals. And we, we realized, I guess, that because we are about trying to create community, camaraderie, connection, conversation, albeit through competition, having an individual's event online, it felt a bit disingenuous, to be honest. Um, so therefore, well, we thought, well, we thought, well, you know, brilliant pairs, um, that, that would be a really fun way of doing it. You know, you get your training mate, um, you get to train together, perfect the, the communication topic, the synchronization timing and, and all of that, um, which in itself is actually a bunch of fun and actually not as easy as it looks. And then to compete together, that felt much more appropriate um, and then, you know, we've already touched on the whole topic of mental health. Um, and again, that, that sort of cause, it causes conversation and people reaching out um, to train and compete with their mates. So again, from a mental health perspective, that became a really important focus for us. And it's such a relevant topic, not only here in Australia, but around the world. It's such a relevant topic, you know, suicide prevention, mental health. Uh, it, it, it's significant. And it, I think unfortunately sadly a bit like cancer you'd struggle to find someone who hasn't either been touched by mental health topics themselves or that they they know someone who has whether it's a family member a friend um, and therefore it makes it very relevant and it, so it's our way of being able to raise awareness support that uh, and at the end of the day it's very relevant for many many people in our communities and that's that's important so the Grand Slam um, became for 2020 um, a pairs event, uh, which you know we, we are because it hasn't run yet. Runs in June. We're, we're very excited about it. It's been a really great response to the fact that it is a pairs event. Um, it, it's much more enjoyable to compete in pairs. Uh, it makes you more accountable, actually, because <laughs> um, you don't want to let your mate down. It makes you more accountable to continue to you know, to train consistently and, and to compete consistently. And, and again, it's more fun. Um, and, and our audience you know, overwhelmingly stated that they, their, their preferred way of competing was in pairs. Yeah, that's good to hear. That's awesome. <clears throat> so you mentioned it kicks off in June. Um, is there anything released uh, at the moment as uh, around like what workout equipment is needed or what the workouts kind of look like, or I'm not sure what's um, currently available about the the event um, when this is going to be aired. Um, but where can the kind of the listeners um, find out more about this if they want to join? Yeah, no, I appreciate the question. Um, and by the time this goes to air, uh, what I'm about to say will be common knowledge. We, we've literally just spent the last. Over the last 48 hours, we've been um, with the team. We've basically gone, okay, you know, we've got the C19 situation is upon us. Um, the world is in a state of relative chaos. Uh, there's lots of people now under financial stress. Um, with they've been stood down or, or, or they have lost their job or they don't know if they're going to. Um, people are homeschooling. So, <laughs> um, I don't find not I don't find homeschooling funny. I just wonder whoever created the idea of homeschooling probably wants um, tying to the rig and whipping with a, uh, a drag rope, um, because I know lots of parents I've been talking to over the last week or so. <laughs> they're not enjoying the extra time with their kids. They love their kids, but they now have a much better appreciation for what teachers go through every day. <laughs> um, I guess with our dogs and cats, we don't have those issues so much. Um, but um, Long story short, most of us right now when this is being aired are still going to be very much in uh, a self-isolation or quarantine situation without access to a full gym or even any gym equipment. So we, we with Will Henker, head of programming and the team, basically have parked the programming we had carefully developed for this year's event um, and we can use that next year at the end of the day. It's not wasted. And it's pretty awesome. Uh, I have to say, I'm looking forward to it. But nonetheless, we've basically developed a whole new program relevant to what we're calling the C19 edition. So that anyone can do it from wherever they are. 
with minimum equipment or minimal equipment. And the only gym, let's say gym specific piece of equipment that anyone will need is a jump rope. Um, and what we're saying at the moment uh, to anyone that's following us or is, is going to um, is you've still got weeks, weeks and weeks and weeks to get yourself a jump rope. So if yours is at the gym or you don't own one, you can buy one. They're, they're not expensive um, and they're easy to ship and they're cheap to ship. Um, by the time this goes to where we may have um, uh, an Australian company on board to just make a bit of an offer to make, you know, to ease the financial burden, not, nothing for us. It's you know, certainly not. Um, so you'll need a jump rope. You'll need a chair and a backpack or a bag of some description. And the bag is simply so you can load some weight in it, put it on a set of bathroom scales, confirm the weight. Here we go. So um, I have to say I've seen the programming per se it hasn't been it's, in, it's been tested um and it's going to be a lot of fun but it's really a competition uh, but i have the huge amount of respect for will and the, and the gang uh, because they had to break down well okay uh, what are the options we've got what, what what movements have we got available with what limited equipment to test strength conditioning you know, upper body lower body and so on uh, in a way that it's, it's fun as well it's not just grueling um and of course, we've got the added complexity now. It's a pairs event. So unless you're doing it with your husband or wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, mum, dad, whatever it is, um, and you happen to live in the same house and can do it together, um, we've basically ensured that you can still do it remotely. So you and I could do it right now. And the way we'd do it is like we are right now. We're on Zoom. Uh, you could use Google Hangouts. And like we are, we're recording it. So we can see each other. Um, so we can have the, the smartphone or the laptop or the desktop you know, over in the garage or at the side of the lounge room, doesn't matter where it is. Um, and we can do the workout. Um, we can have a timer, we time. Uh, we had Brendo from um, Perth FitFam or FitFam Finder. Um, he did it very kindly, did a little video the other day where he tested it and he had his iPhone uh, or whatever phone sitting um, facing <laughs> the laptop with we time counter on it to count down, five, four, three, two, one, go. Um, and, and you can see both of us and the clock. So you, you actually see everything. Um, so it can work. Uh, we've been testing it, it works. And so it means that it doesn't matter who you are or where you are, you can do it. It doesn't matter the fact we've got this pandemic going on. And, and that's the point, it's about inclusivity, it's about getting everyone moving, feeling involved, being part of the community. And, and certainly what, what we had done, we'd got an amazing prize purse. Um, the you know, the, the non-C19 edition had an incredible prize purse. And the C19 edition now has an amazing prize purse because we've made it free. It's not a paid event anymore. Um, we're conscious that you know, there's a lot of people under financial stress. Hey, none of us are immune, let me tell you. Um, my business is as well thoroughly affected by uh, C19. So um, we're, we're the same as everyone else. And uh, we understood that that would that could be a barrier for some people even though we'd already cut the price in half um just to make it accessible as the thing evolved um like the government um you know having to make new decisions each day um on a much more grand scheme let me tell you i'm not comparing the two um but so our our thinking had to evolve as well and so we, we settled on the decision you know what it's all about the community it's all about inclusion so therefore there's no money involved except for that there was only one downside to that. We had committed that we would give one uh, one dollar per regio to uh, a mental health charity in the country where that regio came from. So if you signed up for the Grand Slam, um, we'd give a dollar to Are You OK? If you were from America and signed up, then we'd give a dollar to the Walking Wounded Project and so on. And we've got arrangements with Canada, uh, UK, US, Australia, New Zealand and Brazil. We've got you know, one charity in each. But of course, if you make it a free event, they wouldn't get anything. That's one downside. So we've committed to not only make it free, but we'll still put the dollar in. For every rego we get, we will put the dollar into that charity um, because otherwise they lose out and we don't want them to lose out. So, um, so what I would say to, to your listeners, um, right now, regos are absolutely open. It's a free event. It's in June, it's five workouts over three weeks, completely C19 friendly. Um, and it's gonna be a bunch of fun, but we still have some great prizes actually. Um, and if you'd like, I'm happy to share um, what, the, what the big prize is because it's pretty awesome.
Well, you can share if you want, but if you want to hold on to that and um, release it later on, then you're more than welcome to do that. I'm sure the listeners are, um, will um, will be able to look into that if they want. Do you want to share it? Yeah, I'd love to tell you about it because it, it's right. awesome. Um, it, it's, it's the Grand Slam Masterclass is what we called it. It's basically a, a weekend in Jervis Bay, a uh, full sort of training weekend, if you like, um, run with Alethea Boone and Khan Porter. So there'll be 10 pairs, 20 people, therefore, that will win an invitation to join that masterclass. And in that masterclass, which is going to be awesome, because Alethea and Khan are awesome, um, we're going to run it at CrossFit Jervis Bay, kindly. Um, they've said that we can use their facility to run that. And we'll have... Of course, the Queen of Gymnastics being there, we'll have Alethea teaching us how to do all sorts of things um, that we didn't think were possible. Uh, the King of Conditioning with Khan Porter uh, will be doing some amazing workouts. But as well, there'll be um, you know, presentations from them talking about mindset, nutrition. Um, for sure, we'll get out on the trails. We'll get in the bay. We'll, we'll get the stand-up paddle boards out. You name it, we'll just have an amazing weekend. And there'll be plenty of time for chillax as well. And we'll catch up for dinner with the guys and just maybe find our way to Jervis Bay Brewery, possibly. <laughs> and uh, it'll just be awesome, frankly. And it's pretty intimate. It's only 20 people, uh, 10 pairs. And so the winning divisional pairs will win an invitation. Um, and then the rest will be name out of a hat. So you don't need to be the fittest or the fastest. You have the chance of winning part of the grand prize anyway. And that's the point. That's everything we do is about inclusivity. Um, and we feel that this... Is something we can still, even though it's a free event, we can manage that. We can, so it's, it's on our cost. People just need to get here. They need to obviously accommodate themselves, but the rest is on us. Um, and that's, I guess, something that we wanted to maintain um, and still uh, give people, yeah, A, something to look forward to, B, to really compete for, and C, it's just super cool. Um, a weekend with those guys, who wouldn't want that? So, um, that, that's where we're at right now with the Grand Slam 2020. Uh, you have to adapt or die, right? So um, it's our way of giving back to the community. It's our way of, being, I guess, by June, um, if we're still in lockdown, we'll have been in lockdown by then for eight to 10 weeks. Um, mental health very much becomes a topic more and more and more as time goes on. Um, keeping people focused and, uh, and moving and motivated will become, you know, will be even more relevant then than it is now, even more relevant. Um, and I'm aware, you know, when we're recording this, there's quite a few pop-up um, events around the C19, which is awesome. I mean, again, you know, you talk about community and being part of an amazing community. It's a global community, yeah? and it's frankly amazing uh, and something we're very, very pleased and proud to be a part of. Um, but for your listeners right now, thebaygames.com.au, it's free. Go register. Pick your buddy, go register. We're using Competition Corner. We'll still have live announcements. The sooner you register, the better, because each week we're issuing weekly workouts um, just for fun, um, as in it's not part of the competition. There is a leaderboard uh, so that each week you've got some kind of something to focus on. You can benchmark yourself a little bit. But the idea is that you connect with your mate who you're going to train with uh, or compete with, and you do that workout. And those workouts are quite carefully put together to give you, well, let's say, an advantage, um, because maybe some of the movements will be in there that you'll need for the actual event. Definitely some of the aspects around communication um, <laughs> will be, I, I laugh because um, often, yeah, in, in testing we've seen you know, some pretty handy athletes being a bit, oh yeah, yeah we've got to do that synchronized, yeah, yeah, no problem, three, two, one, go. And they just kind of fall apart and go, hang on, stop, 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 stop. We need to talk, hang on. And immediately, it's a conversation being caused. It's awesome. Um, and, of course, we're seeing some amazing blooper reels now as well <laughs> as people are, are sort of finding their way with the technology and getting Zoom friendly. And, and yeah, it doesn't always go right first time. And we're saying that the best bits are the blooper reels at the end of the day. So, um, so yeah, it's still a real competition. We still have uh, our international panel of judges who will absolutely be reviewing the videos from the top 10 of each division. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. And... Yeah, as I say, to have Alethea and Khan at, at the end of, on the horizon, as there's something to aim for, even if you don't win, we're going to have names coming out of a hat. Um, so you can still win. So my advice would be, it's a no-brainer. Tell all your mates, get involved. Um, there's no cost to it. 
um, and let's let's continue to rally around each other and again make sure no one gets left behind especially yeah. by June. June's a long, you know it seems a long way away um, it will have been a long time by then eight, eight to ten weeks by then and yeah I think we uh, we all have a responsibility to each other in the community to just make sure we put a re you know reach a hand out and, and make sure we're all there still banding together it sounds like a great time um, and some great some great prizes, it sounds like, and um, great initiatives in all this um, all around sounds like an a awesome time. And so if you are listening and you're thinking of um, uh, jumping on board, start practicing your Zoom workouts with your partner. Get on board those Bay Games workouts that they release. Um, like Matt said just before, hint, they might be you know, um, preparing you for something. So get on board and start practicing your Zoom um, workouts now by June um, I'm saying uh, I'm going to say a lot of people are going to be pretty good at zoom by then um, <laughs> but we'll see so yeah start practicing with your workout partner and um, yeah we've got to we've got to move on and wrap things up shortly but before before we jump off I want to get a book recommendation from you doesn't have to be about training or anything it could be mindset could be mental toughness what, what, whatever, what, what's one book you would give to someone? You know what, you did pre-warn me, didn't you? That was a question. I, yeah, I guess with everything going on, I perhaps hadn't given it enough thought. But, so therefore, I must give you the most genuine answer, um, which, yeah, the one that popped to mind, but a little bit because of what we spoke about earlier, was um, I'm Here to Win by Chris McCormack, um, I think the three-time Ironman world champion from Australia, from Cronulla, in fact, in Sydney, um, who now lives in Thailand. Um, yeah, I'm here to win um, by Chris McCormack. Uh, a really, I, I really enjoyed his book, and actually, I had the opportunity of interviewing him and chatting with him. It's a cool guy, and I think it was in there. Uh, there's there's some golden nuggets in there, uh, and one, if I've got time, I'll try and make it really quick. But uh, and I nearly referenced it earlier, but I didn't. Um, but it was that whole mental toughness, how to handle the mental toughness, and for him. You know, he, he went and part of the book is very much, he, I think he tried two or three times at, at Kona, the Ironman World Championships, and failed. Uh, I think it wanted and even finish. He pulled the pin, um, yet was winning everything else he was competing in around the world at that distance. And he talked about how he deals with the pain, the hurt, when it comes. And that's the point. And he actually said what he says to himself is, you know it's going to hurt. Like all of us, we know, we look at a, an eight minute AMRAP, doesn't matter what's in there, it's gonna hurt, you know that at some point, you're gonna have lactic acid buildup, you're gonna be heart rate through the roof, um, gasping for air probably, and, and it's gonna hurt. And he said, well, he, he said, you know it's gonna hurt, everyone's gonna hurt, and so he's ready for it. And he actually says in his mind, when, it, when he starts to feel it, he goes, the pain, he says, ah, there you are, I've been expecting you, I didn't know when you'd turn up, but here you are. And then he'd go through his mental checklist. Okay, how am I feeling? How's my heart rate? Do I need to eat? Do I need to drink? Do, 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 do. How's my legs? How's this? And by doing that, he's now distracted himself from the pain. And he said, even if he has to, as soon as he stops thinking about it, oh, no, it's still there. Boom. How am I feeling? How's my heart rate? And he just has a little mental checklist that he'd go through. And at the end of the day, he's distracting himself. So that was one of the, uh, one of the many nuggets I got out of that book. And um, I could have cited some business books, but that was the first one that came to mind. So um, I am here to win. Awesome stuff. Sounds like a great read. I'll chuck it in the show notes below for anyone yeah, um, awesome. interested in checking that out. So um, before we before we end this, where do you want to send people from here? Yeah, honestly, right now, um, not not only for yourselves, but for the uh, for the extra dollar that's going to go per rego to Are You Okay if you're in Australia, um, then go to thebaygames.com.au. It will take you directly to the Grand Slam page. Hit the register now button. It'll cost you nothing, um, and you'll be getting aboard uh, an amazing journey. So, um, and please share it. Share it with everyone. Get your mates involved right now. Is a, it's about getting everyone involved. And um, yeah, every registration we put another dollar on the table for. Are you okay? So um, there's no downside. It is literally a no-brainer. So. Um, thebaygames.com.au. I'll, I'll put the link in the show notes as well. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. All right. Thanks for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure, Matt.
No, thanks, Alex. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I appreciate being invited and um, yeah, I look forward to, uh, so I'm sorry we couldn't catch up in person. I know we planned to, um, but because of C19, we're on Zoom like the rest of the world. So uh, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. Yeah, I was really looking forward to heading down to Jervis Bay, but um, unfortunately, not going to happen uh, this weekend. I'll have to head down another weekend. Absolutely. We'll look forward to that. All right. Thanks.